Good morning. And thank you, Jamie. It's great to see everybody here today. Tanya and I have two very special guests, my nephew Timothy and his fiance Lakin, all the way from Middle Tennessee, came in the other day, and we've been touring around some in Fort Worth and Dallas. We enjoyed going to the sixth floor museum, Dealey Plaza, and reviewing again the events surrounding the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. And I thought as we looked at the pictures and we heard the audio recordings and I saw a line of cameras and from each one a picture that had been taken. And of course the famous Magruder film, right? The eight millimeter that's been shown and replayed many times. I thought, you know, I believe in the Bible for the very same kinds of reasons that I believe John F. Kennedy was assassinated. And those events happened. And that place is real. And you can go there in Dallas and you can be in that book depository and you can almost put yourself back where that tragedy occurred. Of course, the Bible is different in many ways from the rest of history because it records the supernatural, the intersection of the heavenly realm with this earth. In a few moments, I'll be preaching on how Jesus disarmed the devil and be talking about demon possession and those fascinating episodes. And so when it comes to the Word of God, we find absolute accuracy in every matter, every word God breathed. And we also see the Lord stepping into history, creating history, involving himself in that spectacular period of time in which the Spirit of God inspired these words. One of the questions you've asked this quarter is, why do we believe the Bible? And I thought that's really the most basic of all. Some years ago, I did a series on this theme, and I'd like to take the notes from it and send it out through the servingandsharing.com. So if you'd like to have those notes, you'll sign on there. As they are produced and released, you'll get them. But we talked about the external evidence, and I pointed at that time to 50 archaeological discoveries that are related to the Bible, things that have been found continually over and over and over Again, we talked about writers outside the Bible like Josephus and Tacitus and Suetonius, various historians that wrote. And then the internal evidence inside the Bible, the unity over all the centuries and the three languages and three continents and various authors, and yet one picture, one theme, one message. In addition to its unity, we described its pro predicted prophecy found in no other religious writing. And the fact that what was spoken there happened then, and it's clearly connected and cannot be denied. And then the accuracy of the Word of God, even regarding medical matters, personal hygiene, diagnosis of leprosy, and those things that are contained in the Bible that could not have been deduced or known by the people at the time if God had not revealed them. The diagnosis and the cure, the Bible tells us who we are, what we've done, how we got to our current state, that we're lost and we read on every page, yep, that describes me, yep, that's what I did, yep, that's who I am. And then the cure, the only cure for the basic issue of sin and guilt in the cross and resurrection and triumph of Jesus Christ. Then we talked about transforming the world, you know, a book written uh, titled, What If Jesus Had Never Been Born? And another one from the same author, What If the Bible Had Never Been Written? And we talked about hospitals and education and literacy and care for orphans and widows and the weak, the removal, basically, of abortion and other crimes and sins against life. Then we talked about the greatest life. We took two sections there on Jesus as we're doing through our sermon series this year. The indestructibility of the Bible, the efforts made over the centuries to burn all the copies and get rid of them. And yet, as we're going to see today in the question of the books of the New Testament, by the providence of God, what the Spirit gave has been preserved 
It's been protected so that we can have confidence in it today. And then God's final answer. That which has stood the test of time. Jesus said, heaven and earth may pass away, but my words will never pass away. So I wish we could take more time. This is so important. We need to also consider what you've asked along these lines uh, regarding how we got the Bible. We talked in my previous session with you about the Old Testament canon. Now we'll talk about the new. Neil Lightfoot was our brother in Christ, and he wrote a scholarly book by this title, and I recommend it to you. So finishing up the Old Testament canon, we want to note that Jesus himself affirmed what we call the 39 books given before he came. In fact, God spoke to Moses, Jesus said. And when Moses wrote, it was God speaking. Matthew 19, haven't you read that at the beginning, God said, and then he quotes the Genesis account. Complete, inspired, trustworthy, authoritative. Remember the jot and the tittle? The jot was the yod, the smallest Hebrew letter. Jesus said it's going to stand. And the tittle is that little projection that distinguishes one Hebrew character from another. It will endure. Sometimes Jesus and others spoke of the Old Testament in two parts, the law and the prophets. Don't think that I came to abolish the law and the prophets. That's our entire Old Testament. Or three parts, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms, as he mentioned. There's a statement when Jesus talked about all the innocent blood that had been shed. And he said, starting with Abel, all the way to Zechariah. Abel was the first one killed by his brother Cain. And Zechariah was the last one, as recorded in Chronicles. For Jesus to say from Abel to Zechariah is like we would say from Genesis to Malachi. From the first book, as they would have ordered it, to the very last Jesus distinguished the old from the new. We've sought to do that as well. When he said the law and the prophets, there's the two part, proclaimed until John. And John began to announce the coming of the gospel and the kingdom. And so what we sometimes call the various ages, the patriarchal age and then the mosaic and now the inbreaking, the preparation for uh, the era of Jesus Christ. Since then, he says, the kingdom of God has been preached. And then, of course, the New Testament letters go back to look at the old as God breathed. No scripture, a matter of one's own interpretation. That is, the prophets did not say, this is what I think. This is how I see it. Let me describe this from my point of view. Peter says, these holy men of God were moved by the Holy Spirit. And the word translated moved is a word that sort of means picked up and carried from one place to another. That word is used again in Acts 27. You remember Paul and Luke and others were on the ship that wrecked. And at one point Luke writes by inspiration that the ship was borne along by the wind. It's the same term. These men were under the influence so that through their personalities and their background and their experiences and their lives, the Spirit of God carried them so that what came forth was God's Word through them. And then in Hebrews, for example, today, the Holy Spirit speaks. How does the Holy Spirit speak today? Well, Hebrews says the same way he's always spoken in the written Word of God. Hebrews 3, quoting Psalm 95. Today, the Holy Spirit is still saying. And so the Word of God, living and active, breathing, sharper than any two-edged sword. Hebrews 4, 12. So we wanted to talk up to this point about these questions that you have raised. Why do we believe the Bible? We talked before, difference between old and new. Why do we focus on the new? Because we're under that administration or covenant, so to speak. Why do we preach from the Old Testament? Well, we noted the principles, the basic elemental fundamental matters 
on which the New Testament is built. We said the old is like a foundation and the new is the house. If you take out the foundation, the house cannot stand. And then the canonization of the Old Testament books. Let's go on now to a couple of other matters you raised. One has to do with the Dead Sea Scrolls and those that were found in the caves at Qumran. And weren't there some writings there that were from the Bible? Yes, the Old Testament and others that were not. Well, why aren't those other writings included with the Old Testament? I think that's what uh, you wanted us to address. And then another question, what about the books in the New? How were they canonized? And was a book like James not universally recognized by all segments of the church when it first began to sec uh, circulate? And then what about translations? Which ones should I choose? Well, that's a lot to cover this morning, but let me hit some high points. And then if you want to discuss this further, we can. In 1946 and 47, there were a couple of Bedouin boys, and uh, we're told that as they went past those caves at Qumran near the Dead Sea, they would throw rocks in. And in one case, they heard a clack or some kind of resounding noise, and they went in, and these pots uh, contained ancient manuscripts in 11 of those caves. They've been explored, they've been investigated. Some of them date even from the time of Christ and just before. If you ever want to read all the documents, here's the book, Discoveries in the Judean Desert. Well, what was the origin of the group that settled uh, in that region? It's highly debated. Some think that they were Essenes. Essenes were another sect of the Jews not mentioned in the Gospels, but present at the same time. You had the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Zealots, but you also had this uh, reclusive, you know, live out in the desert, kind of a monastic, let's have our own community. They could have been Essenes or another group of Jews, but they separated themselves and lived in that area where they grew their food, they raised their families, they copied manuscripts. And so among those, we find basically the entire Old Testament. Esther is paraphrased in Aramaic to some degree. And Nehemiah did not show up unless it was part of Ezra, which is quite likely. But remember, we're not looking to the Dead Sea Qumran community to determine the canon. The point we've made over and over and over again is a book is canonical because it's authoritative. It's authoritative because it's God breathed. And where people recognized that fact, fine. But whether they did or not, or it took them some time, it was still the word of God from the time it was written. The people who lived in Qumran had a fascination with some books more than others. Multiple copies of the Torah, the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, and multiple copies of Isaiah. Isaiah, of course, we sometimes call the Messianic prophet, wrote so much about the anointed one that would come and save the people and redeem them and rescue them. The Qumran community definitely anticipated the coming of one or maybe even two messiahs. One of the greatest discoveries for you and me as Christians is the complete Isaiah scroll, which I have seen and you can visit today at the shrine of the book I've told you about that's in Jerusalem. The entire museum is made to look like a big scroll. And when you go inside, the facsimile of this Isaiah scroll circles around uh, a structure within. The reason it's so important is because that Isaiah scroll dates 1,000 years earlier than the earliest copy we have of Isaiah. So think to yourself, Isaiah's been copied, copied, copied like the other biblical text for hundreds of years. And so we have one, let's say, from 1,000 AD, not too long ago. 
Has it been accurately transmitted and preserved from one generation? Well, here's one from a thousand years earlier. And other than minor matters of spelling or transposition, that kind of thing, they are identical. And you and I marvel at the providence of God and the precise, tedious certainty of getting this document exactly as its parent was so that we can stand on solid ground regarding these texts of the Old Testament. Say, well, boy, I wish we had the original. You know, go back to Isaiah, 700 B.C. We don't have the originals of any Bible books. We call those the autographs because they were written by the person himself, uh, the writer. We don't have those. But the copies have been so meticulously made, and the Dead Sea Scrolls evidence that. Now, in addition to biblical Old Testament text, there are sometimes what's called sectarian documents, rules of the community. Halakha, this was teaching material, hymns and liturgies and wisdom, Bible interpretation, paraphrase, uh, astronomical cal uh, calendar text and apocrypha. We talked about the apocrypha when I was with you a few weeks ago. These books that were never accepted by the Jews as authoritative or inspired. There were no New Testament texts found in Qumran. The documents do reflect the belief in some kind of a righteous teacher, so-called, that was endowed with God with special illumination and could discern the times and the scriptures. So I might see it something like a cult in which this person, whatever they say, that's the way it is. This is the new prophet. This is fearless leader. This is the enlightened one. And so we should look at the Dead Sea community as representing standard Judaism at the time, but rather more of a, we're going to go off in the in the woods, we're going to go off to the caves and wait for our Messiah to arrive. Some have wondered whether John the Baptist had any connection at all because of his lifestyle and his activity and his location. There's no evidence in the New Testament that that was the case. But John was a voice crying out in the wilderness. And in his dress and his diet, and his fiery style, he definitely stood apart from the Jews of his time. All right, let's move now to the New Testament. What about these 27 books? And as they were written and compared and read, we know that some were intended for a particular kind of audience. We could tell by reading, for example that Matthew seems to be intended for Jewish readers because again and again, in telling the life of Jesus, he says, this happened so that this word would be fulfilled. Born in Bethlehem, uh, taken to Egypt, uh, babies and uh, the massacre by Herod the Great. You can go through Matthew and see so often uh, this kind of setting. Mark has more translation for those that might have been Roman. So a book written that explains some Jewish terms and some think that Mark had a Roman readership. Luke, the only Gentile. We said he was a convert to Christ. He was with Paul in Troas when they observed the Lord's Supper, first day of the week. He was on that shipwrecked journey to Rome and so forth. Luke seems to write by inspiration for all people everywhere. Jesus is the universal Savior. And we have the, uh, the weak and the uh, widowed and the poor and the sinful and those that might have been neglected by society. And then, of course, John with the seven signs and the seven I am sayings showing Jesus to be the Son of God. So... As these four were written, we may take it for granted that because they recorded accurately the things of Jesus, which had been 
passed along orally, people talking about what they knew that he had done and said and where he had been, that the writings came together, not always going to the same address, but depending on who the first readers were. And then as others circulated, these four and only these four, we need to stress that point when we come to the fictitious gospels in a moment, just these four were regarded as accurate and authoritative and God breathed. Now, open your Bible with me. Let's look at uh, several of these. Jesus made it clear that the Holy Spirit would guide his apostles into all truth. And those things which he did not tell them because they were not prepared, the Holy Spirit would. And through them would come, you turn to John 13, the record that we recognize as binding, if you will, in John 13, verse 16, he talks about uh, the one who is sent, speaking to them, and then verse 20, whoever receives, um, whomever I send receives me. The word apostle means one who is sent. And so he's preparing them the night before he dies for the role that they will play. Chapter 14, 26, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. This is focused narrowly on those with Jesus at the Last Supper that he would empower and enable. If you turn over to chapter 15, again, this same night, the helper is going to come, 1526, the spirit of truth, he'll testify about me. And you will also, because you've been with me from the beginning. And then in chapter 16, 13 and 14, he will guide you into all the truth. For this reason, we understand that the scriptures closed with the time of the apostles. And when someone talks about a later prophet coming along, or someone claiming to be inspired to have the latest word from God, and it's not in here, Jesus eliminated that by saying all truth would be given to the apostles. When you read the New Testament letters, you hear Paul saying, I didn't receive this from men. No one taught me this. It came by a direct revelation of Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 2.13, I'm thankful that when you heard what we preached, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God. 2 Thessalonians 2, if you get some letter and it's not genuine from me, don't believe it. Maybe it says the day of the Lord's already come and you missed it. It's not authentic because it didn't flow from the pen of the apostles. 1 Corinthians 4.17, so I direct everywhere in all the churches this apostolic authority that what he prescribes for Corinth, he also for Galatia. You know, as I told the other churches, this is the way you do the contribution. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. What about 1437? If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or a spiritual man, let him recognize this. That what I'm telling you is the word of God. Then you'll read like Colossians 416 that Paul's letters seem to be passed from one to another. Look at Colossians 4 for a moment. This letter we assume would have gone first to the people of Colossae in Asia Minor. But then the other things that Paul had written, uh, letters might even be swapped from one place to another. Chapter 4, 16. When this letter is read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. And you, for your part, 
read my letter that's coming from Laodicea. Now, that tells us a couple of things. Not only that each letter had a venue, had a targeted audience. We say the New Testament letters are occasional. That is, they're written to address particular occasions. But we also see that there was such an overarching role given to the apostles that what was written to the one could then be exchanged with another congregation. And it tells us, as we noted last time, the Bible didn't drop out of heaven, fully bound with gold edges and maps in the back. Then when Peter writes his second letter, he speaks of Paul writing of some things that are difficult to understand. And he says, these matters that are hard to understand, the ignorant and unstable will twist them. They will distort them as they do the other scriptures. As they do the other scriptures. So Paul's letters are being collected how many at that time uh, might be referred to, we, we can't say. But as Paul wrote, those letters were accepted and treated with this technical term of Scripture. Scripture is that which is holy, which is sacred, which has come from heaven. That which uh, we stand on and believe in and practice. And for Peter in the first century, to regard the letters of Paul as scripture along with what had been written before illustrates and confirms this process that took place. So as each New Testament book was written, how's it connected to Jesus or an apostle? Because Jesus laid it out. This is the way it's going to be. What is the content of the book. And as it circulates and people read it, does it bear marks of inspiration? And so it's accepted over a period of time in some cases. So some were a bit slower than others. So keep in mind, you've got a bit by bit, piece by piece, kind of courier perhaps going out. You can read in the New Testament about Epaphroditus coming to visit Paul in, in Rome and taking the letter back to the Philippians. Or you can read about Epaphras in uh, Colossians, who apparently did the same thing in, in taking the letter. But as a letter would come to one place or another, and these matters were considered, who wrote the book of Hebrews? Humanly speaking, well, we can't say for sure. Uh, if you have some versions of the Bible, it will say at the top the epistle of Paul or St. Paul to the Hebrews, but it's anonymous. And so as the book of Hebrews was read and considered, what was its relationship to the authoritative leaders that Jesus had given and so it bears similarities to the writings of Paul. Many of the same topics and ideas are considered, not all of them. And the personal greetings at the end of the letter to the Hebrews, the mention of Timothy. Timothy is out, released now. He's coming to you soon. And so perhaps God gave Hebrews through Paul. Perhaps he did. Uh, James, you asked particularly about James. James may have been the first New Testament letter written. It's very practical. It speaks to those who were uh, biological Jews that had come to follow Christ. It starts out to the, to the tribes that are dispersed. And uh, when James speaks of the meeting of the church in chapter 2, he doesn't use the word ecclesia that we've sometimes heard for the church. He uses the word synagogue, the word for synagogue. But synagogue just means assembly. It doesn't necessarily mean a Jewish. He was speaking to the church. 
And remember, that's where he warned us against discrimination and prejudice based on outward appearance or a person's level of wealth. And, oh, you sit here. No, you stay back there. James is a very practical book. And it talks about the relationship between faith and works in chapter 2. Well, since the book of James arrived, people have discussed how that related to Romans and Galatians. Romans and Galatians, we're saved by faith in Christ. We're not saved by our own merit, by what we deserve. We don't work our way up to God. Eternal life is a gift by His grace. Book of James says, man not justified by faith alone. But you see, Abraham, wasn't he justified by works when he offered his son Isaac? And you see Rahab, the Canaanite, in a similar way. He said in James 19, you believe God is one, you do well. The demons believe also and they shudder. The two fit perfectly together. You and I understand this. In Romans and Galatians, of course we're saved as a gift of God. But that salvation is vindicated. It's confirmed. It's made obvious by what we do as a result of that faith. And Paul is as clear about that by inspiration as anybody could be. Read Romans 6 through 8. If you are justified by grace through faith when you've been baptized, now you live as a servant of God and obedience and righteousness. If you go back and sin, hey, the wages of sin is death. Saved by grace through faith when you're baptized and you repent. And as a result of that, you must not, you cannot go back to sin. And so your works demonstrate so he wrote in Philippians 2, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. James at the same time is not saying that Abraham and Rahab earned something from God through their obedience, but rather if they had not obeyed, they would not have had genuine faith. Can you imagine Abraham saying, God, I believe you, I trust you, I'm depending on you, but I refuse to offer you my son. I'm not going to do it. Would Abraham have had real faith? James says no. Paul would agree. But this was apparently some of the discussion, the fact that James was written to Christians who were physical Jews, and also the discussion of faith versus works. And during the Protestant Reformation, Martin Luther took it upon himself, wrongly, to decide he didn't want James, book of James in his Bible. Luther called it a right strawy epistle. And the reason Luther didn't like it was because it didn't talk about uh, a lot about the cross and about uh, matters related to how Jesus uh, paid the price for our sin. Just remember, as the book circulated, then with time, the providence of God the recognition of those books that are given by him. It's evident through the early centuries as well, which we don't look to as our authority, but as a reflection. We've said when people recognized that the memoirs of the apostles were on a par with the writings of the prophets as early as 150, that's a testimony to the point we're making about scripture. In AD 170, something called the Dia Tesserum, which was a harmony of the four Gospels, as we often see today, but just these four. And so the later writings claiming to be real Gospels were recognized not to be. Irenaeus in 180, again, we're in the second century, noted most of what we have in the New Testament also included the shepherd of Hermas, which is not a biblical book, and the fact that Irenaeus noted it there does not make it part of the Bible and does not question, really, the fact that it should not be included. Upon investigation, people realized it treated Jesus as a mere mortal, not God from the beginning, and said that God 
adopted him. So it was, didn't fit, wasn't consistent. Well, we'll go a little bit deeper here, and these notes again will be available. The Muratorian fragment in the second century, we don't have the whole list, but it does note Luke has the third gospel, John, and then Acts 13 from Paul, Jude, two of John's letters, and Revelation. You can see a couple of our books are not there, but again, the list is not complete. The so-called Apocalypse of Peter cannot be an inspired book, and uh, it gave you some reasons there. Second century, long after Peter was gone and claimed that God would save all people from hell. Um, so uh, going on a little bit, origin, I want to notice this with you especially. Don't worry too much about the specifics, but origin in 230 AD wrote about the very same content that we have in the New Testament. The uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, notice he named them by their human authors. Peter with his two trumpets, his two letters, he notes James, you asked about James, and Jude. There was no question about these in the time of origin. Uh, John, through the epistles and revelation. And Luke, the book of Acts, deeds of the apostles. And then, if you count Hebrews with Paul, you have the other 14. So exactly our 27 New Testament books in 230 A.D., long before the time of Constantine and the so-called Da Vinci Code and all of those things that uh, we mentioned in our previous time together. In A.D. 367, we find a list of the 27 in exactly the order that we have them today in our New Testament. No doctrine is dependent exclusively on one book of the New Testament. You look at some list, don't be disturbed if there's a minor difference. God's providence allowed time, but instead the consensus is amazing, and it remains today. If you ever wonder about books that are not in the New Testament, try reading one of them, and you will see immediately why they do not stand the test of inspiration. Packer just makes the point that the church didn't give us the canon any more than Isaac Newton gave us gravity. Gravity was there. He said, hey, look at this. The same is true of the books of the Bible. I'll say one more word about the so-called lost books of the Bible. Look at the quotation at the bottom. In the so-called Gospel of Thomas, which is a collection of sayings attributed to Jesus, so foreign to what we know of him from the Word of God. Peter says, Let Mary leave us, for women are not worthy of life. Jesus said, I myself shall lead her in order to make her male, so that she too may become a living spirit, resembling you males, for every woman who will make herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. These writings came from a false interpretation and view called Gnosticism. It was a developing heresy uh, in the time that these fictitious writings were produced. And apparently people thought if they put someone's name on it, let's put Thomas on it, let's put Peter's name, then maybe it will be accepted and we can spread what we believe. And then one final word about Bible translations. Look first, I would say, for accuracy. If a Bible is called standard, like we have in the pew, the English standard version, or I have with me today the New American Standard, the term suggests that this is one by which others may be judged or evaluated. It's a standard. This is one you can bank on. So I would just recommend not necessarily one of these two, they're just common, what's in the pew and what I have with me today. But something that stresses first, as close to word for word or literal as, as possible. Maybe it has footnotes when something has been uh, rephrased. There are idioms in the Bible. For example, when 
Uh, Saul was in the cave in the time of David. Most Bibles will say something like Saul went into the cave to relieve himself. We understand that. It's, it's an idiot. The Hebrew text says he went in to cover his feet. Well, there's no English Bible that says that exactly, went in to cover his feet, because for us to understand it, there's something of a trade-off. But then if you're reading, say, the New American Standard, there'll be a footnote. And the footnote in the New American Standard will say, literally, cover his feet. And that may help you to see why it's worded the way it is and what it's intended to convey. So I have a friend that says, and I echo this, the best Bible for you is which one? It is the one that you will read. It is the one with which you will take your notes that you will memorize and you will put into practice. It's certain Certainly some paraphrase and, and way out there that uh, we wouldn't advise at all. And some translations are now going toward more of gender neutral and they're changing pronouns. We, we wouldn't support any of that. Accuracy first, then understandability. And then perhaps have two that you compare side by side. Well, I know we've covered a lot of ground. Thank you for being part of our class today. And through this entire series, I've Enjoy the others that have taken their turn and those that will in the future. Thank you again.